Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's discussion. The Bassler Center for BRCA at Penn Medicine's Averson Cancer Center is the first comprehensive center devoted to funding research across the globe, educating providers and patients and advancing care for patients with BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene mutations. Dr. Edward and Mary Prostick have generously established this webinar as part of the Elizabeth Prostick Memorial Outreach Program in memory of their daughter. The Bassler Center is proud to be part of this mission by providing life-saving information and hope to individuals and families worldwide. Lizzie Prostick was an amazing young woman who believed in the promise of tomorrow. And though her tomorrows were cut short, we can celebrate and sustain her optimism. Lizzie lived large. She loved the stage and brought it to life with her voice and her energy as a talented child and as she grew into a woman. Her world was full of loving friends and family and success in class, in sports, with girls, and with boys. Sophomore year of college, Lizzie met Michael Lundblad, a liberal and an English major. He got a preview of her leanings when he saw her quizzing a friend about senators. But she learned to love camping. He learned about couture. And political opposites, Michael and Lizzie spent 10 years together, marrying their minds and their passions. Michael loved her boldness and her softness, her interest in so many different types of people, and ability to remember the small details of their lives. The time she made to talk with her grandmother, her pearls, her red shoes, red shoes that said she was not afraid to be noticed. She was not afraid. Lizzie's intellect and drive were rewarded with exciting opportunities. She blazed through the University of Pennsylvania and into the halls of government, determined to win in every venue and for every cause that was important to her. Her work for senators and on committees quickly made her a Washington insider. She rose to chief privacy officer and senior advisor to the Secretary of Commerce before being lured away to the private sector. Not yet a lawyer, she was named managing director at Sun and Shine, Nath, and Rosenthal in Washington, D.C and was completing her law degree at night at George Washington University when she died. When Lizzie was awarded a posthumous degree at the law school graduation, the entire audience stood in tribute to her spirit. Lizzie was 31 when she was diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer, and her daughter Harper was four months old. Michael did research. Lizzie didn't want to know the odds, expecting to beat them but the cruel reality was that although breast cancer is generally curable, metastatic breast cancer is not. And they found little support to help them deal with the psychological and emotional realities they had to face. In her last months, Lizzie and her family began to envision an online support network that would show patients with metastatic disease that regardless of how long they have to live, they have the ability to control how they live. This was Lizzie's final cause, and one which will be honored. Lizzie wanted to see her daughter's first birthday. She didn't make it, but she lives on in the people who loved her, and through grants such as this one being made in her name. And in truth, none of us knows how long we'll live, so we all should listen to Lizzie and make the most of every tomorrow. Live large, live strong, and wear red shoes. Today's program will address updates in hereditary cancer care and recent scientific advancements. This presentation will be archived and will be available on our website, basser.org. 
please feel free to submit questions for Dr. Domchek through the chat function, and we will get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation. I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Susan Domchek, a board-certified medical oncologist, ambassador professor in oncology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, executive director of the Basser Center for BRCA, director of the Marianne and Robert McDonald Cancer Risk and Evaluation Center at the Abramson Cancer Center. Dr. Domchik has committed her career to pursuing research related to genetic susceptibility to breast and ovarian cancer, particularly with regards to risk ass assessment, screening, prevention, and treatment. Dr. Domchik, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thanks to all of you uh, for being here today. Uh, we have had a bunch of questions submitted in advance, so I've tried to incorporate as many of them as I can into the presentation. They'll also be sort of at the end, a uh, rapid fire, but along the way, um, please feel free to enter your questions and we will address as many of them as we uh, possibly can on the way through. So just to get started, you know, I want to remind everyone of the mission of the Basser Center, which is to use cutting edge research in basic and clinical sciences to advance the care of individuals living with BRSA 1 and 2 mutations. And again, this is something that I think everyone on the call knows, but BRCA1 and 2 mutations are associated with significantly increased risk of cancer, particularly breast cancer, uh, ovarian cancer, in men, prostate cancer, particularly for BRCA2, and an increased risk of pancreatic cancer. And our goals are to try to uh, prevent these from occurring. Um, and uh, along the way, we're learning a lot about the basic biology as well. So the Basser Center, we really do have a comprehensive approach to this complex uh, challenge, including making sure people get genetic testing and that they're aware of things. Um, we really have an active area in prevention, which we'll talk about, uh, screening, treatment, and survivorship. And as you can see by the many different bullet points, uh, there's no way that I can uh, approach all of this in an hour. Uh, so we're just going to do some of the highlights of the last year. First, these are our currently funded investigators. At the top are our core investigators. These are individuals who really kind of day to day live and breathe uh, BRCA1 or 2, or uh, Dr. Fonderheide works on uh, cancer vaccines. We have also given out grants this year to early career investigators, as listed here. These are uh, people in the beginnings of their career uh, to get them interested in BRCA1 and 2 as a future career. And then our two-year uh, grantees are listed here. And again, I'll highlight as much of the work uh, of these individuals as I can. Now, we also give out external grants. Uh, this year's external grantees include individuals from the University of Texas, University of Leeds in the UK, University of Melbourne, uh, and the University of South Dakota. So you can see that this is a truly inter international endeavor, and we try to forge strong collaborations uh, throughout the world uh, to really advance uh, the research as much as possible. To give you a little bit of an update on our annual symposium, this is May 10th and 11th this year. Our schedule is that the 10th is a scientific symposium. In the beginning of the day, it's very basic science, um, moving into the global prize presentation. And then our breakthroughs and discoveries panel uh, which is towards the end of the day. And this is uh, generally uh, more uh, geared towards a lay audience. Um, there will also be uh, a little celebration for our 10 year anniversary. And the second day will continue the scientific symposium. Our global prize awardee this year is Andrew Nusenzweig from the National Cancer Institute. And our breakthroughs and discoveries panel will be moderated by me, include uh, Dr. Nusenzweig, as well as Dr. Andrew Tutt, um, from the UK and Fiona Simpkins from Penn. And so it should be a really interesting uh, discussion. I urge you all to attend and to get more information at basser.org. We have a number of community engagement initiatives, our Black and BRCA and our Latinos and BRCA initiatives. Uh, this has specific website landing pages. We have tailored educational materials, blog posts, virtual events uh, with Penn faculty and staff. Um, as well as our Basser Center, Young Leadership Council members and community organizations. And we also have Spanish a translation of patient-facing materials. Uh, this is a really active area of interest uh, and we really are keen to decrease disparities uh, of genetic testing in various populations. 
<clears throat> we also have our parents leadership community that is launched, and this includes webinars and panel events, including talking with your family about BRCA mutations and a BRCA family affairs series uh, with families affected by BRCA mutations. We also have a risk factor questionnaire on our website, so feel free to check all of that out. Related to disparities in genetics, in our research work, uh, we uh, published a uh, paper looking at the prevalence, uh, which is just how many uh, germline pathogenic variants in uh, cancer susceptibility uh, genes in black women versus non-Hispanic white women in the United States. And actually there really are no significant differences in the two groups, just underscoring that um, race should not be used as a factor to determine who should get genetic testing and that we should have um, equal testing rates. Um, uh, Kate Nathanson has a large grant from the NCI addressing physician barriers to genetic testing. Um, we have a point of care study testing all individuals with pancreatic cancer and metastatic prostate cancer. Um, and we have a grant with Dr. McCarthy and Contis using mammograph database at Penn and 25% of our individuals at Penn are black women. So really trying to look at um, ways to narrow the gaps. We're also keen on increasing diversity in the workforce. Thanks to the incredible generosity of our donors, um, we have been able to fund a UPenn Masters in Genetic Counseling uh, scholarship for an underrepresented minority uh, student. Um, and in addition, we have a summer uh, URM program uh, internship, which is an eight week experimental experiential program to expand the pipeline of underrepresented minority students in genetics research. And this is our first uh, group last year. It was terrific and we're selecting our, uh, our individuals for this summer. Where we wanna decrease barriers to genetic uh, screening and testing. And uh, we've talked a lot this uh, a little bit about this before, <clears throat> but we have ongoing studies with telegenetics, digital health platforms, um, what we call point of care testing using videos, and importantly, we've been trying to really leverage the electronic medical record. Sometimes the electronic medical record has seen, if you will, as a dirty word, um, but actually it can be, when used correctly, it could be very valuable to identifying individuals who should be getting genetic testing but are not. Uh, we've had multiple publications in this space, including our use of a video for pretest counseling in pancreatic and, and metastatic prostate cancer and our use of a digital health platform for those of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. Um, both of these were done in collaboration with uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering for the first and for the second Memorial Sloan Kettering, Dana Farber and uh, UCLA. We also know that uh, unfortunately, even once a BRCA1 or 2 mutation is known, it is, can be surprising sometimes how few additional family members undergo genetic testing. And as we all know, and uh, we'll talk about further, this information can really be potentially life-saving. And therefore, we wanna try to make it as easy as possible uh, for individuals uh, to get their relatives uh, testing. And that includes being able to explain to their relatives why it's so important. And finally, which I'll talk about in a little bit, clinical decision support um, is an additional component to help our patients. So to go through a few of these, our eReach study, uh, this is led by Angela Bradbury, is comparing a uh, approach of digital health platforms versus telegenetics by genetic counseling uh, to look at uh, whether or not uh, patients are satisfied with this approach. But really, this is to significantly expand the ability of individuals to get uh, genetic testing. And so this can be in any state in the United States. Dr. Bradbury's uh, program has her uh, genetic counselors uh, licensed in every state in which licensure is needed. And so it can either be uh, by telegenetics or again, through the web platform. And the goal here is to get all metastatic cancer patients who qualify for genetic testing, again, metastatic breast cancer, any ovarian cancer patient, and any patient with pancreatic or metastatic prostate cancer are candidates for this testing. So if you know someone who is having difficulty accessing testing, you know, and they, it doesn't matter where they live in the United States, this is a potential option for them. And we all have all of this on basser.org, so you don't have to uh, memorize all of this, um, but we have our um, contact information listed. So again, if relatives um, with those criteria are having a hard time test, yeah, getting tested, 
um, please um, uh, feel free to reach out. In addition, as mentioned, we have a hard time getting family members tested. That might be a surprise to people on this call because you tend to be our, our the, the people who understand best um, why this is important. Um, so here, this is a study that's led by our genetic counselors. And the primary uh, objective is to see if, if providing, if you will, a toolkit uh, to our individuals who have just tested positive for a, a gene mutation, whether this could be helpful to share information with their at-risk relatives and to look at that uptake. So we're looking at things like a chat bot, a family letter and websites, and basically reaching out uh, to the family members of these individuals. And so um, we actually do even have permission from the IRB that as long as um, our proban, meaning the initial person who came in for genetic testing, uh, allows us to, uh, we can even directly reach out uh, to other relatives. And so this is, you know, this can be really hard. You may not know your cousin very well. You might exchange you know, a holiday card once a year. We're trying to make it as easy uh, for individuals as possible to make sure that this information gets to their family members. And related to the electronic health record, um, we have really been working on uh, trying to make this uh, genetic testing information easy to find. Uh, you'd be surprised at how hard it is right now to find a lot of, uh, of this information because you might remember getting your genetic testing report, which was a piece of paper, which ends up being a PDF you know, that is scanned into the electronic medical record somewhere probably labeled lab, which is not necessarily very helpful for ever finding it again. Um, we uh, at Penn, um, we use a system called EPIC, which is used in 50% of the United States. So it's very generalizable. Uh, and, and we have done a lot in this space, including um, working with uh, laboratories that do germline genetic testing to have this data um, more streamlined into the electronic medical record. Uh, we've also created decision or have been developing clinical decision uh, support tools. And this is kind of uh, very uh, mocked up here, but basically one of our most common messages that we get, you know, is am I due for my MRI? Um, and it can be hard to sort out, but this would, if you will, ping people, um, uh, you know, like, you, it, like it's done for mammography, um, but which right now is not generally done for other things. <clears throat> so there's a lot of potential in here. Other things that we are doing at Basser is uh, looking at or uh, uh, doing a very robust uh, biobanking protocol. So anyone who is interested um, uh, can, can help join the cause. DNA is easy. We can uh, uh, have people spit in a tube and send it back to us. And with this, we have many domestic and international collaborations uh, looking um, at uh, other genetic modifiers. We also have her draw plasma, which is blood, and we draw blood once yearly on individuals seen at Penn. With this longitudinal blood collection, we can use these samples uh, to help figure out uh, better ways um, to have early detection. Uh, that is one of the questions that someone has asked and we'll, we'll get to at the end, uh, but we are really uh, have developed a, an incredible collection of nearly a thousand BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers who have donated blood yearly. And as you can see, we have uh, 43,000 available specimens just in terms of the total number of tubes that we have. The tubes are small, it's not like we draw that much blood, uh, but you're getting the idea. And this is extremely valuable. And so we have ongoing collaborations to look for um, uh, uh, different early detection assays with Johns Hopkins, uh, Dana Farber, um, et cetera. We also have a evolving tissue repository of breast tissues and healthy breast, uh, breast tumors and healthy breast tissue uh, from BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers going into their prophylactic surgery. Um, we are looking at immune functions uh, in BRCA carriers with or without cancer by analyzing this breast tissue and also uh, factors in the blood. Um, and we are keen to establish associations between molecular and immunologic uh, features um, in uh, tumors. Um, this uh, collection going on at Penn um, has uh, you know, led to collaborations funded by the Gray Foundation with Dana-Farber um, Mass General Hospital to really uh, try to get a robust pre-cancer atlas uh, going uh, to answer some critical questions. 
we do, we're not going to focus on, the, on this too much, but we also are interested in other genes. Um, and I think uh, people know that it's beyond BRCA1 and 2 these days. Uh, there's multiple other uh, genes that are, apologies, that would be my 18 year old, we're just gonna turn that off. Um, so we have uh, individuals with multiple other genes and we're looking to better understand information um, about them. And so we've enrolled through an online registered close to 10,000 individuals uh, with gene mutations and other genes uh, with very robust follow-up. People are uh, very happy to, to continue to give us information um, uh, year to year. We've had a number of uh, publications uh, related uh, to, to, these, um, uh, uh, to this registry. So our, our next uh, thing is, uh, again, one of the key questions that people have asked about is whether or not taking out the fallopian tube uh, can uh, decrease the risk of ovarian cancer sufficiently so that individuals could potentially not uh, do uh, surgery of removal of the ovaries, or at least wait until after the age of natural menopause. And I want to be clear from the start, the standard of care remains uh, the removal of the fallopian tubes and ovaries by age 35 to 40 for BRCA1 mutation carriers and 40 to 45 for BRCA2 mutation carriers. That is the standard of care right now. There have been several studies, one called WISP, one called TUBA, which got some very early data on this question of taking out the fallopian tube by itself versus the fallopian tube plus the ovaries. And pretty much those studies have shown that you have fewer menopausal symptoms if you leave the ovaries in place. But, and they gave us some initial feasibility data. It was safe. Um, there were women who were willing to join these studies. And so now this, this next study, um, uh, which is through the NRG, is the definitive study to really look at the cancer question. The other studies were not powered to look at cancer. So the way that this study is set up is that um, it's women with BRCA1 mutations. This study is particularly focused on BRCA1 mutations um, because of the higher uh, risk of developing ovarian cancer and the fact that the ovarian cancer occurs at earlier ages. So these are women over 35. So that would be the, if you will, standard time that you would start talking about the potential to remove the ovaries and less than 50, because after 50, definitely uh, we would like everyone to have their ovaries removed. And this is, comes with a lot of counseling because the, again, the standard of care is stated to be removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes. Some women choose to have uh, just their uh, tubes removed and again, with or without the uterus. The uterus, if you will, is optional, and we can talk about that later, whereas the ovaries and the fallopian tubes are the critical component. And so uh, this now looks at, uh, very carefully, we'll look at what we call patient-reported outcomes, including things like menopausal symptoms and sexual dysfunction, and we'll look very closely at the risk of ovarian cancer. Uh, and the, the idea is specifically in this study to look for cancer incidents. So this isn't just about symptoms. This is, can we successfully prevent cancer by taking out the fallopian tubes um, and safely leave in the ovaries? And I think that's, it is just a critically important question. So again, this is the hypothesis that taking out just the tubes is what we call non-inferior to taking out the tubes and the ovaries. Um, and these eligible patients, again, are BRCA carriers between age 35 and 50. And you can see here that it will take nearly 2,300 patients to self-select one of these two arms over 10 years of accrual to answer this question. So this is a large study. It's an important study. Uh, Ronnie Drapkin, who is at Vassar, is the head pathologist um, for the study. Um, and we're really going to, 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 we look forward to this information. As I tell um, individuals when I see them, as a, a scientist and a researcher, I want tons of people to join this study. But when I have an individual person in front of me, I want them to have their ovaries out. And so this is the real tension. And as a, as a physician, you know, we really want this answer because of course we would like people to be able to avoid 
um, early oophorectomy, um, but we want to also have the data to, to support that. So how about a, a next question? So our next question um, that was, uh, was uh, put in was whether or not polygenic risk scores could be used to help uh, determine the necessity and timing of preventive uh, surgery. So what is a polygenic risk score? Well, a polygenic risk score is a, co a combination of things that we call single nucleotide polymorphisms. Single nucleotide polymorphisms change the risk of breast cancer by a very small amount. Uh, and, uh, but we know about 300 of them now. So if you have, if you will, all 300 good ones versus all 300 bad ones, that impacts your risk of developing cancer. And in the general population, uh, in someone without a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, you, the, the people at the lowest risk by these polygenic risk scores might, be at the might have a lifetime risk of breast cancer of 5%. Those who are at the highest uh, are at 20%. So you can see that it really does, in the general population, skew the population into individuals that might be able to have every other year mammogram at 50 versus yearly mammograms versus potentially needing MRI. Studies have been done, including through this group called SIMBA uh, that we uh, collaborate uh, with and show that these modifiers do change the risk in BRCA1 and 2 carriers as well. But the issue is that they, the, how much do they change the risk and how do individual patients internalize that risk and think about it? So in collaboration with Memorial Sloan Kettering and Dana Farber and led by Jada Hamilton, who is at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, we are looking at this issue of giving back genetic risk uh, modifier information to individuals with BRCA1 and 2 mutations. And again, the goal is to, to determine the impact of this on individuals' decisions about preventative mastectomy. So, you know, we have en enrolled the initial 25. We're trying to catch up to Memorial, which started earlier than, uh, than we did. And patients will get back a report sort of giving their residual lifetime risk of cancer and how these SNP scores might affect it. And so, you know, this is early work just trying to explain these numbers to individuals and give them a sense of you know, where, how much um, these modifiers have really impacted things. And uh, again, so uh, if people are interested, uh, Dana-Farber Memorial and uh, Penn all have uh, this study open. Another thing that we've done this year is in, in uh, working, uh, and this is work that uh, is led uh, by Fergus Couch and Kate Nathanson um, with a, uh, a uh, R01, uh, multi-PI R01, uh, which we published in uh, JCO um, in 2021. And this looked at individuals who were 65 and over. So basically, at, think about it this way, at 65, these individuals did not have cancer, but they had a BRCA1 or 2 mutation or a mutation in another gene. And then we were able to estimate the lifetime risk of breast cancer to between ages basically 66 and 85. And you can see that for um, several, for pretty much all the genes, this is ATM, BRCA1, BRCA2, uh, CHECK2, and a gene called PALB2. But in all the situations, the lifetime risk of developing cancer was less than 20%. Now I'm not saying that that's uh, you know that's nothing, and it's certainly higher than an individual of that age that doesn't have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. But it helps us counsel individuals who are trying to decide on screening versus mastectomy, um, for instance. And so you know if you're you know 75 years old, your lifetime risk to age 85 is is not that high, and so it's completely reasonable to consider you know, just screening um, rather than mastectomy, given that there are downsides. So this is just further information to individualize risk. All right, lots of questions about uh, pancreatic cancer, um, uh, the pancreatic cancer risk and pancreatic cancer screening. And so for, for this, I'm going to uh, 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 give a show a slide uh, that was um, uh, lent to me by Bryson Katona, who is one of our our um, uh, gastroenterologist 
here at Penn specifically interested in pancreatic cancer early detection. So on the left, you can see what the risks of developing pancreatic cancer are. In the general population, you know, the risk is, you know, one to 2%. For a BRCA2 carry, it's two to 4%. For BRCA2, for a BRCA1, is two to 4%. For a BRCA2, around 5%. Um, and if you have a family history and a BRCA2 uh, mutation, it's greater than uh, 5%. And so there's been a number of uh, different uh, a, a, um, different guidelines or studies that have been done to try to define who it is uh, that might uh, be good screening candidates for pancreatic cancer. And more recently, the National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network uh, did come up with pancreatic cancer um, uh, guidelines in terms of who should get pancreatic cancer screening. And right now, if you have a BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, or PALB2 mutation, and a family history with a first or second degree relative, pancreatic cancer screening is recommended at age, starting at age 50 or 10 years younger than the youngest pancreatic cancer. Um, and I'll talk about in the next slide what exactly um, we, will, um, we will be offering. It is of note, and it's shown down here that pancreatic cancer is actually rising in the general population as well. We don't entirely understand why this is, but it is one of these cancers that is going up. Um, um, things like obesity, cigarette smoking, alcohol may play a role, but it's beyond that. And those do not seem to have a particular multiplier effect in BRCA uh, mutation carriers, but we don't know what's happening in the general population in any good sense. One of the questions becomes, what about screening BRCA1 and 2 mutation cares without a family history of pancreatic cancer? Um, so Dr. Katona has had a study ongoing here at Penn uh, looking at endoscopic ultrasound in individuals with BRCA1 and 2 and other mutations that do not have a family history of pancreatic cancer. Um, and, and so our numbers uh, were relatively small in this study, um, but there was some hint that potentially it could be valuable, although of note, um, BRCA2 is probably the, the, the key player here. So more work definitely needs to be done in this space about what, who exactly needs pancreatic cancer screening. And I urge people who are interested in this um, to be part of ongoing clinical trials or at least registries so that we can have these data to really answer this question. So what do you do for pancreatic cancer screening? You know, again, effective screening, we want it to find a cancer earlier than we otherwise can. We want it to have an, uh, allow for an intervention like surgery. We want it to improve survival. We want it not to be harmful. And it has to cost something that's reasonable. Um, you know, the definition of cost effective is variable, um, but it can't be prohibited. One thing that's of interest, and uh, again, I, I, I want to say this up front, most people who develop diabetes do not have pancreatic cancer. However, it has been shown that in people who have a pancreatic cancer diagnosis, definitely some people develop diabetes in advance of that. So particularly for BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers, if people start to develop issues with their blood sugar, this is something that you know, I use as a reason to go looking uh, at their pancreas. Right now, the preferred imaging approaches are an annual MRI or an endoscopic ultrasound. An MRI looks like this down here and an endoscopic ultrasound, they put the probe down into the stomach and look from the inside out basically at the pancreas, which is shown here. CT scans don't generally give enough information and abdominal ultrasounds um, are, are very dependent on um, the, op, the skill of the operator and also, if you will, the body habitus of the, the patient. Um, if you're skinny and you're, the duodenum, which is air filled, is not in the way, um, it's possible, um, but the standard approach is annual MRI or endoscopic ultrasound. Um, CA199 screening really doesn't work, so we don't use it. This issue of blood sugar testing and, and diabetes screening is sort of an adjunct. And the other things that are sort of on the list here are these newer assays like uh, Galleria um, and this Imray uh, PanCan uh, 
These assays are currently what we call CLIA approved. That means that they've gone through a process by which um, the, the, the company can sort of reproduce them. Um, that doesn't mean that they have been shown to do exactly what we want them to do. Um, so I'd like to differentiate that. So these two tests are available. They are not covered by insurance. And I would say that we are waiting for pivotal data uh, to answer the question of whether they work. Uh, both have shown positive effects in what we call case control trials, comparing cases of cancer to individuals who don't have cancer. Um, but as I like to say, I don't need the test to find cancer when I already know the person has it. I need to find it beforehand. And um, both of these uh, companies have done prospective studies. Um, uh, the GRAIL has presented their Pathfinder 1 study, and you know, the case numbers are still very small. So I would say it's not kind of ready for prime time um, yet, but there's a great deal of interest. And the MRA study, a very, uh, there has been a prospective study done that we're waiting for the information on. Um, we definitely um, want to have imaging improvements. And this is where artificial intelligence and uh, you know, data science could come in and look at MRIs over time, for instance, and see if we can find an early finding before there's a pancreatic mass. And of course, we're always interested in novel biomarker development, which is why the, the, the large um, prospective blood collections that we have could be very valuable. All right. So the next thing is the, uh, and I'm also looking at the, you can probably see, I'm gonna to try to look at the questions as I go. Um, so uh, there is a question about melanoma. So let me answer that question really quickly. Um, so melanoma, uh, in general, we consider melanoma associated with BRCA2 mutations with a lifetime risk around 5%. A recent study didn't see that, uh, but I, I think it's easy enough to get a dermatologic exam. So in, uh, for BRCA2 mutation carriers, we do recommend an annual dermatology exam. Um, there is definitely an association with a rare, 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 rare cancer called uveal melanoma, which is a cancer in the eye, which again is, is very rare. Um, but in general, um, the, uh, the, the risk is sort of small, but the cost of doing a skin exam is, is also small. Um, melanoma is a common cancer and it's very, uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very tightly linked to sun exposure. And so uh, we always have to factor that in, um, in, in, our, in our patients where in Philadelphia, lots of people have hung out at the Jersey shore, you know, all their, during their entire childhood, um, which is its own obvious risk factor. Okay, so what's the outlook for the, the next generation? Um, obviously uh, we feel like we've made tremendous uh, progress um, and since these genes were cloned, there's been so much work that has, has happened, but we obviously want to do better. And we don't just want to uh, diagnose cancers early. Uh, we don't just want to have surgical prevention. You know, we, we want to do better. And so this is, you know, a, a, just a schema demonstrating kind of this, this concept of cancer interception. And so I'll take you through it. I think most people know that in general, you start, if you have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, one a copy of BRCA in your cells is good and one copy is bad. That's how you're born. You have, generally, you have, two, you have two copies. And if you're born with a BRCA mutation, one copy has a mutation, one copy is normal. At some point in time, this, in most, most cancers, the second copy is lost, okay? And that when that second copy is lost, there you really develop those very first abnormal cells. That eventually goes into an early stage breast cancer and that can develop into metastatic cancer. But when we, we, draw, when we develop medications in cancer, we always start with metastatic cancer. We start with the, the cancers, if you will, that are most difficult to treat. And then we take it into an earlier stage and actually only rarely do drugs get tested in the prevention space because prevention trials are hard to do. You just saw the numbers needed uh, for the study of taking out the fallopian tubes and it's over 2000. So you're really starting to get the sense of why that kind of uh, study is hard. 
And on the other hand, it's critical, right? This, this, is, this is the place we want to have the maximal impact. So we are really considering, if you will, biologically informed disease interception. Well, we're trying to focus right here. We're trying to focus on that first, the loss of that second allele word and those first abnormal cells. And that's where we really want to uh, target. And so we have a lot of work to do in this area. Uh, but again, we're, this, is, this is where we're, we're trying to go. And um, think about it this way. You know, we know that, if you will, uh, 25, before the age of 25, a BRCA carrier uh, is very unlikely to develop cancer. And over the course of the next few, uh, you know, number of years, some abnormal cells uh, start to accumulate. What if we, at that point, could do some sort of intervention, and we'll talk about what the possibilities are, to make those cells go away and to reset the clock back to that baseline. And maybe that happens again, but we have a different kind of way to intercept and we, again, push it back to baseline. You can see that we might be able to then just ward off the development of the cancer in that way. Unless you think this is complete craziness, I'd like to make the argument that colonoscopy, this is how colonoscopies work. Colonoscopies, you don't just get it just to get it. You get a colonoscopy because if they see a polyp, they take it out and they intercept colon cancer. That polyp is now not going to become a colon cancer. It's gone. And so I think that we really want to really rethink um, this. And that's where we're headed um, in the Vassar Center. So how do we do this? Well, there's a number of different potential approaches and some of which we're already working on, a lot of which we need to, you know, we're, we're hopeful about, you know, we can do cancer specific approaches. We can do pathway approaches. I'm gonna talk about a drug called denosumab, which is a rank ligand inhibitor in a minute. We can have immune approaches such as vaccine. And of course, we wanna develop better early detection strategies, as I mentioned. You know, we're at the University of Pennsylvania where of course, uh, Ben Franklin has famously you know, said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And uh, that is really where, you know, we want to go with this. And that raises, you know, a the next question, which is, have any advancements been made in the development of a breast cancer vaccine? The first thing I'm going to just toss out there is, what do we mean by a vaccine? And the reason I bring this up is because these, these words are used differently, and they, they just have different connotations, and, and, um, and they're all important, but we want to be very precise. Vaccines to treat metastatic cancer. You know, metastatic cancer is cancer that's spread outside the breast, in the bones of the liver or the lungs. It's generally felt to not be curable, although treatable, um, and we get better at treat, treating it all the time. When we talk about vaccines to, to treat metastatic cancer, this is where a lot of the research work had been done, you know, over the last few decades. And it's a harder space because in general, um, in the metastatic setting, it's harder to um, get the vaccines to work well. Um, and so that hasn't, that is an area that, that is not being as explored as much because instead uh, there's been a lot of work using different immunologic approaches like what we call checkpoint inhibitors that rev up the immune system or CAR T cells, which are um, T cells which have been modified to attack cancer. Another way to think about a vaccine is that you have breast cancer and you are going to take a vaccine to prevent your cancer from coming back. And there's a lot of work in this space, which is basically you can sequence a tumor and develop a personalized vaccine. But what I'm really gonna to talk to you today is the idea that we wanna use a vaccine to prevent cancer in the first place. So not to prevent it from coming back, but to prevent it from, uh, in the first place. And so we um, do have an ongoing open vaccine trial. Uh, this is a DNA plasmid uh, vaccine, which includes three different uh, uh, you know, uh, genes, HTERT, WT1, and PSMA. And that's given either alone or in combination with something called IL-12. And it's given with electroporation. So the stuff on the right seems scary, but I promise we've treated a bunch of patients and it, it doesn't 
it's not as bad as it looks. Um, in fact, people tolerate it extremely well. These little needles down here are like acupuncture needles. And then a vaccine is given. And then there's an electrical jolt that is given to better enhance the uptake of the vaccine. So we have two cohorts. The first cohort is cancer patients with BRCA1 and 2 mutations. This actually was just re you know, requested by the FDA just to get specific information in BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers. So these are individuals who've had a prior history of cancer, have no evidence that their cancer has come back. Uh, and we're treating eight patients um, with the vaccine alone and eight patients with the vaccine plus IL-12. And then we're using a, going next to a cohort of 28 patients without cancer. So we've completed our first, the cohort A, ARM1, and actually uh, then we need to take a mandatory pause and we have our next three patients lined up. Um, so we're basically five patients away from starting to treat healthy BRCA carriers. Um, this uh, has been a little bit of a long time in coming. The, the pandemic did make things more complicated, but we're really, really excited um, about uh, the progress uh, we've made and uh, we will continue to update you on this. Uh, by the way, these are not the only potential things that could be used in a vaccine. These are our candidates of the moment, uh, but we continue to explore other ways uh, to think about prevention. Okay, let's talk about other prevention strategies. Uh, so another thing that's out there is uh, something called rank ligand. Um, and this is work that was done by Jeff Lindemann. He's in Australia, who really was able to define uh, that the subset of cells that turn into BRCA-related breast cancers have uh, are very sensitive uh, to rank ligand, which is just this, this basically this scent, uh, um, uh, this hormone, if you will, uh, that acts on these cells. And rank, rank, rank ligand inhibitors in, uh, in if you will, in, in petri dishes was very effective at blocking the development of tumors. Well, rank, it turns out that rank ligand inhibitors are used to treat osteoporosis, a drug called denosumab, which you may have heard of, also known as prolia or exgeva. Some of you may have taken it. And so this has led to a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-center, international phase three trial. We try to use as many words as possible uh, uh, when we talk about this. This too is in BRCA1 mutation carriers because of the way that these cancers develop. We aren't forgetting about BRCA2, by the way, uh, uh, just as just illustrative. Judy Garber is the overall PI uh, on the Alliance in the United States. Um, I'm part of the executive committee, and this literally just got activated in the United States um, last week. And so the kickoff is going to be in the next few weeks. So this is a really interesting trial. This is for women who have not yet had mastectomy. Um, there'll be, again, 3,000 people, um, denosumab versus placebo every six months for five years uh, and uh, to see uh, if this can decrease the risk of breast cancer. So again, you're getting a sense of how hard and long these trials are to do, but how exciting is it that we have these definitive trials for the removal of the, ovary, uh, removal of the fallopian tubes and denosumab, uh, which will answer these questions definitively. So again, at Penn, we have the Inovio trial, which is the vaccine trial. And again, this is for BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. It's worth stating that the vaccine, the, the antigens that are in this vaccine have the potential effect of uh, decreasing the risk of breast, ovarian, prostate, pancreatic cancer. Indeed, more than 95% of human malignancies overexpress telomerase. And so this is you know, uh, you know, why we're interested in this approach. Denosumab is specifically for BRCA1-associated breast cancer, but obviously it's a drug we know well, and it's easy to deploy. Uh, so again, if you're interested, basser.org, this is the study coordinator here. All right, now we're gonna talk uh, about drugs. Uh, don't worry, I'll leave time for questions. It's been so exciting to be part of this field. Um, I, I have been so lucky to be part of the development of these PARP inhibitors. It's a little bit overwhelming to now say that these PARP inhibitors are approved by the FDA for multiple indications in breast, pancreatic, ovarian, prostate cancer. They're effective in BRCA1 and 2 associated cancers. Um, my uh, colleague, Kim Rice-Binder, um, 
has uh, also looked at rucaparib for BRCA1 and 2 related and PALB2 related pancreatic cancer. The way that you look at this is anything below this line here is tumors shrinking. And you can see how effective uh, this drug was. Again, not a huge study, but effective in both uh, BRCA1 and 2 mutations in the germline and also the tumor only, and also for PALB2. And we just recently found out last week that this is now included in the NCCN guidelines as a potential treatment option. So that's extremely exciting. In addition, big news about the Olympia study. So the Olympia study, again, is for individuals with BRCA1 and 2 mutations who have breast cancer. I know this is a busy slide. And this takes individuals who have triple negative breast cancer who had you know, gone through their chemotherapy and not had all their cancer go away, what we call non-pathologic complete response, or had uh, tumors that were greater than two centimeters, or in ER positive disease, they had to have much more cancer, greater than four positive lymph nodes or, or um, a lot of cancer left at the time after chemotherapy. But individuals got all their usual treatment and then were randomly assigned 1,800 individuals to take a lap rib for a year versus placebo. Um, and these, um, I'm fortunate to be the chair of the Translational Advisory Committee uh, for this study. Um, and we have presented uh, data um, last year, but most importantly, uh, there's been uh, the overall survival data has been updated. So the data that we published in the New England Journal of Medicine showed an improvement in what we call invasive disease-free survival. This is just breast cancer um, coming back either in the breast or outside the breast. And you can see that there's a 9% absolute difference, which in breast cancer is huge. In terms of a, the dis, uh, difference in cancer coming back outside the breast, it was a 7% difference. And at the time of this study, this uh, the survival benefit was not statistically significantly different. But these data were just presented last uh, two, a week and a half ago um, at one of our large meetings. And you can see now uh, that there is a significant difference at four years overall survival of 3.4%. Uh, and that might not seem large, but in breast cancer, this is a very large effect because the uh, breast cancer, these curves tend to continue to get bigger over time. So basically high risk breast cancers for BRCA1 and 2, we, we consider giving a lap rib, a PARP inhibitor, which is a pill for a year to try to further decrease cancer coming back outside the breast. That applies to you, ask your doctors because it's not for everybody. There are risks involved, um, but um, it is certainly something to be considered. If your cancer was long ago, we wouldn't do this because again, this is, you know, you've already, if you will, um, done well. One thing that's important to, to note is that people generally, there are side effects, uh, nausea, things like that. But in this study, because this was another question asked by someone, the, there was no difference in leukemia in between a lap rib versus the sugar pill. And so at least in breast cancer, we don't see a difference in leukemia risk. But when you look at new primary cancers, there were actually fewer in the elaparib group than the placebo group. And some of these were second breast cancers and um, ovarian cancer, which leads to the question of, can you use this drug to prevent cancers? And we're not ready to start those trials yet because we need to know more about dose and schedule and things like this, uh, but it is a really important and interesting area. And so more is to come on that. I did wanna take a moment and just say that last year's global prize winner, Bella Kaufman, uh, was one of the principal investigators on Olympia. And she unfortunately died of breast cancer very shortly after our, um, our, um, our symposium last year. Uh, and she really was a, a true a leader in our field and, um, and really will be uh, very greatly missed. Um, I, I, I don't have time to talk much about basic science, you know, our poor basic scientists, uh, but uh, you know, they, they are extraordinarily important. Um, and we are really actively working on issues about how BRCA1 and 2 interact with other cellular processes and the immune system, better understand why tumors develop in certain tissues, why they may be more responsive to therapy. All of these things are, are really key. Um, at the, you know, uh, this slide was given to me by, by Ronnie Drapkin. Uh, he is also the director of the Ovarian Cancer Research uh, Center at Penn. And again, 
data that's uh, started in uh, patient-derived xenografts in mice. These are tumors from patients put into mice that we can then test combinations of drugs did lead to a clinical trial um, uh, called CAPRI, uh, which was uh, published in, uh, in uh, uh, gynecological oncology, uh, looking at this combination of an ATR and a PARP inhibitor. And so we have a lot of different ovarian cancer studies going on uh, that are biomarker driven. Um, and again, um, uh, uh, you know, we hope to just get to continue to make progress here. We are very interested in using, this is just such a pretty picture, I can never resist it. Uh, we can really do these deep interrogations of tumor tissues now using something called codex, where we can layer different stains on the same slide so that we can see how all these different uh, uh, factors line up. So this is multiplexed antibodies to different things. Some of these are uh, 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 some of these are immune factors, some of these are proliferation factors, but we can sort of see how they all line up on top of each other. And plus, again, really pretty pictures. They are, these are DNA damage repair markers. These are immune cells. Um, so using this kind of technology and you know, machine learning, we can really uh, go to the next level. And Roger Greenberg, whose group has established ALC1 as a new vulnerability in BRCA mutant uh, cancers, which may be a new therapeutic uh, you know, advance. So uh, another other question. So there was a question about uh, the, the sort of decade specific risks of ovarian cancer. And so here, um, this is a, a study uh, by the Embrace team. This is not our work and it shows sort of the risk of breast uh, of ovarian cancer in BRCA1 versus two carriers. This is such an important slide because we often talk about the fact that BRCA1 and BRCA2 are different. And this really shows this. I mean, you can see that the risk of developing ovarian cancer prior to age 50 in a BRCA2 carrier is very, very small. Here it's zero, it's not zero in other studies, but that's why waiting till age 45, if you will, to have your oophorectomy when you're a BRCA2 mutation carrier makes sense. But you can see that for BRCA1, that risk is already up quite a bit. So the risk to age 40 in a BRCA1 carrier is less than 3%, but then it goes up pretty steeply. And so these sorts of curves are really important and is why um, uh, we, the, the strength of the recommendation for oophorectomy in BRCA1 carriers is earlier and this, the strength of the recommendation is firmer. Um, and, and why these uh, studies that are going on are, are, are so important. Remember that we, we don't trust our ovarian cancer screening very much. Uh, we wish we did. That's what all those other tests are, all, those other, all that other work that is going on uh, to establish early biomarkers. All right, this is a bit of the rapid fire portion of the evening, but I also want to get, uh, um, I also want to get to the questions put in the chat. There were really interesting questions about immunotherapy. The, 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 the short answer here is that um, we, we did publish a study back in 2020 looking at the addition of immune therapy to PARP inhibitor therapy in BRCA1 and 2 carriers. And although it wasn't a randomized trial, there didn't seem to be any massive increase in how tumors responded when we added the immune therapy to PARP inhibitors in BRCA carriers. Having said that, it's now standard of care for individuals with triple negative breast cancer um, uh, to get chemotherapy before their surgery and to include as part of that immunotherapy. This is brand new, like hot off the presses in the last few months. And, um, and so immune therapy does have toxicity. Um, any part of your immune system can start to attack part of your body. So that risk and benefit really needs to be taken into account. We actually are, we have designed a study and we're not sure if it's gonna go forward or not yet, but we are trying to design studies to answer the question of for a BRCA1 or 2 mutation carrier, you know, could you, to, tr to treat a cancer, could you use a PARP inhibitor alone? Do you, you know, which part of this do you need? Because what we're trying to do is optimize therapy to give exactly what people need, but not more than that. Um, for fertility, there were a few questions asked about um, a, a pre-implantation genetic testing. Just as a reminder, that's when individuals can go through in vitro fertilization, screen the embryos, and only have embryos re-implanted that do not have the gene mutation. 
Uh, this is, um, you know, a complex issue, uh, but in individuals that, uh, you know, if it's the right thing for them, we obviously will talk uh, to individuals. Another thing that, you know, we, we also like to bring up is if someone is, for instance, you know, 38, hasn't had their family yet, doesn't really have plans to have their family yet, but is a BRCA1 mutation carrier, there are options to do egg freezing ahead of time or embryo freezing if the individual has a partner. Um, the US reclassification, um, you know, in general, when, when variants of unknown significance are reclassified, the person who gets that result is the physician or the healthcare provider who ordered the test. However, you know, uh, and, um, and so, and they are supposed to, to disclose that to you. However, if you like you are, the person who ordered the test is retired, make sure to contact the lab and make sure that there's a way, uh, there's a new provider that's notified because you can, you can specify who that should be released to. PERP inhibitor leukemia risk, I showed you the data from the Olympia study, which again is 1800 people. There have been uh, studies in ovarian cancer that have shown a higher leukemia risk. It's notable that people with ovarian cancer, if they've had multiple recurrences, receive a lot of a medication called carboplatin, which in itself does increase leukemia risk. And so the combination of carboplatin and how much you've had before, plus the PARP inhibitor, and what that does to leukemia risk, I think is under investigation. Liquid biopsies, I tried to tackle that as I went through. And mutation specific risk, I'm not gonna do justice today, except to say that depending on where a mutation is in a gene, there are small differences in risk. For instance, there's an ovarian cancer cluster uh, region of the gene and a breast cancer cl cluster region of the gene. But the absolute effects of these are small, meaning that they do not uh, have very large uh, changes, changes in risk. All right, so now I'm gonna try to, to look at your questions uh, here and there's lots, so this is great. Um, there's a question about HRD testing in ovarian cancer if negative for BRCA. And the answer to that is yes, that's now kind of a standard uh, of care to determine whether an ovarian cancer patient would benefit from a PARP inhibitor. Um, that is not standard of care at this point in uh, breast cancer. Um, there's a question about colon cancer risk for BRCA1. There's really no good evidence that there's an increased risk for colon cancer in BRCA1 in mutation carriers. So it's notable that currently the guidelines are that everybody should get their colonoscopies at 45, not 50. That changed recently. Um, and um, this also depends on family history. Um, so uh, the uh, the uterine cancer risk is, is complex. The lifetime risk of uterine cancer in, in BRC2 carriers really does not seem to be substantively different than uh, the general population. For BRCA1 mutation carriers, the risk may be very uh, slightly elevated. Um, uterine cancer is a risk in, in, in general. So it's, it's not the same you know, uh, level of risk as you know, ovarian cancer. For that reason, individuals who are going in to have their ovaries and fallopian tubes removed should have a discussion uh, for uh, a discussion related to um, the pros and cons of a hysterectomy. Uh, a, a great question that I didn't mention lifestyle are environmental factors and you know, uh, uh, bad on me. We generally always counsel that regular exercise, healthy diet, uh, healthy weight, a regular exercise and minimizing alcohol is sort of the basis. Um, a healthy kind of a heart healthy diet, sort of Mediterranean uh, kind of style diet uh, is also to be advised. Uh, in BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers, the effect of those uh, are, are, are quite modest, um, unfortunately, because if you will, the gene, uh, the gene mutations uh, dictate a lot of the risk. But yes, yeah, certainly um, keeping a healthy uh, lifestyle is also a really good idea just in terms of mitigating the effects of early oophorectomy in terms of bone health and heart health. Uh, related to CRISPR, um, CRISPR, as, as people may know, is editing, using gene editing of, of the cell. Right now, the CRISPR things that have occurred have largely been, you know, the human studies. They've 
they have taken out T cells from people's body, edited them and put them back in. The problem is CRISPR is just not good enough or accurate enough. There's too many errors right now to consider CRISPRing embryos. Um, so, uh, so that's um, uh, uh, that's that issue. Um, Raloxifen, um, another great question. You know the the medications such as Raloxifen and Tamoxifen have been shown to decrease the risk of breast cancer in the general population, specifically estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. We don't have much direct data for BRCA1 and BRCA2, but there's no reason to think that they, they shouldn't work in BRCA2, particularly mutation carriers. And in studies looking at the risk of breast cancer in the other breast, there uh, in the other breast, uh, tamoxifen and uh, tamoxifen has uh, demonstrated a decrease in risk. So we definitely do uh, talk uh, to individuals about the possibility of raloxifen. Um, with that in mind, I know I didn't answer all the questions. Uh, what we are good about is that we will take these questions and we will um, answer them uh, in, uh, uh, in little video snippets. We try to collate them and uh, go from there. So I really appreciate everybody's time tonight. Again, I'm sorry I don't get to every last question, but I promise you that we will address more of them later. Uh, so thanks for your attention and uh, have a great night, everybody.